Good evening and welcome to Design Futures 2020 Student Leadership Forum hosted by Washington University in St. Louis under the fearless leadership of Liz Kramer and her staff at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. This work is also in partnership Good with evening. the amazing and welcome to Design Futures Design Futures team. This convening wouldn't have been a success without support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the City Studio St. Louis Initiative, supported by Bill and Gina Weishmeyer. My name is Penina Achayo-Laker, and I'm an Assistant Professor of Communication Design at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. I'd like to welcome back our students, faculty, and facilitators who have been with us over the past two and a half days engaging in thoughtful dialogue and discourse on how design and designers through education and practice can acknowledge and address the many complex structural and systemic racial issues manifested in the built environment. To do this work well, we avoid perpetuating and, and avoid perpetuating those very issues. We need not shy away from confronting, the under, from confronting and understanding the tragic and divisive policies and systems that lay at the core of the communities and cities we live and work. I know how overwhelming, astonishing, and equally invigorating all this information you are gaining during this convening might be, but rest assured you are in good company. I'd like to remind you of the wonderful words that Teresa Huang shared during Thursday's opening circle, that this space was created for you to make mistakes, to wrestle with difficult questions, to connect and reconnect, a place of reflection and recalibration. You are not alone. We are here for you. To those of you who are joining us from the pub, for the public facing sessions of the forum, allow me to extend a very warm Design Futures welcome to you. We are glad that you're here with us and we could not have planned a better keynote for you to join in this conversation. I am thrilled that you will get the opportunity to hear from Dean Nichols, a designer, social entrepreneur, and alumni of Washington University's Bachelor of Fine Arts and Master of Social Work programs. She's currently a Loeb Fellow at Harvard Graduate School of Design and a 2020 Monument Lab Fellow. She's one of the most passionate, honest, and generous people that I've had the pleasure of interacting with, and is such a trailblazer in interrogating issues of justice and equity in the built environment. She will be sharing a reflective talk on design, illness, and the fight for racial justice. Without taking up any of your time, I'd like to pass the baton over to Rajan Hoyle, a member of the advisory board for Design Futures and one of the team members who has worked tirelessly over the past year to organize and curate this dynamic experience. He's also a graduate student at MIT studying ethnography, spatial analysis, and participatory planning, and has facilitated workshops in Los Angeles, Houston, and Mexico City on various topics ranging from digital inclusion and park equity to transportation policy. Please help me welcome Rajan Hoyle. Good evening to everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Panina, for that warm welcome. And as a shameless plug, please, everyone, tune in again tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. Central to hear a dynamic panel of St. Louis-based designers, educators, advocates, including Panina, speak. You won't want to miss it. As was said, my name is Rajan Hoyle, and I'm the program manager of Design Features. On behalf of our program director, Teresa Huang, and our entire advisory board, I'd like to welcome you all to our inaugural Design Features public keynote. For those that don't know, the Design Futures Forum is an annual convening of student leaders from design programs across the nation. Ordinarily, students all converge on our host campus for one week to plot, plan, plan and scheme up ways to advance design education and design practice towards our collective goal to achieve racial justice and social equity in the built environment. During the course of the week, participants learn from each other as well as from university faculty and leading practitioners through a series of interactive workshops and a local day out in the community, seeing the work up close and personal with designers local to the city we find ourselves in. This strange year, 2020, is our eighth annual convening, and we are so grateful that Washington University took a leap of faith with us to translate this experience into a virtual format. Though we are saddened that we're not able to meet in person and to be in St. Louis, 
We are in the midst of a virtual convening through Zoom, Slack, and email. Participants are engaging with each other in ways we never thought imaginable. I'd like to express gratitude to our sponsors for this forum and this keynote, as Panina said, uh, the San Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Enterprise Community Partners. Thank you so much. We wouldn't be here without you. I also want to take a moment to honor the life of the Honorable uh, Representative John Lewis, who became an ancestor yesterday at the age of 80 years old. Lewis was a staunch advocate for civil rights and served in the United States House of Representatives since 1997, 1987. He was bloodied by state troopers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge while peacefully protesting during the Selma to Montgomery march marches in my father's home state of Alabama in 1965. A real life hero and a champion for racial justice, John Lewis will forever be remembered. May he rest in power. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. And now for the reason that we're all here, it is my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker. I first learned of Dee Nichols and the work that she's doing at the Black and Design Conference at Harvard last fall, where she moderated a panel on the sanctity of Black bodies, uh, creating spaces for wellness and joy. She she's a designer, social entrepreneur, and keynote lecturer that addresses issues within the built environment through the production of interactive experiences, digital media, and social initiatives. She is currently a Loeb Fellow of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, a member of the Design is Protest Collaborative, and recently signed her first book deal for the forthcoming title, The Art of Protest. She travels, works, and speaks all over the nation and the world, but no matter where she goes, she proudly wears St. Louis on her back. Without further delay, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dean Nichols. Thank you. Thank you all so much for that warm welcome. My gosh, I, I was like dancing on the screen. Uh, just for joy. Uh, it's, it's such a joy to engage with you all and join you for this year's forum and also engage as an alum of the Sam Fox School of Design. Um, but before I, I hop into things, I, I want to um, share my screen with you right quick because I'll present from um, a presentation because there are some, some visuals that I want you to show or to share uh, and engage with me. All right. Okay. So as Rajan said, I proudly wear St. Louis on, on my back everywhere that I go. Uh, but unfortunately right now I am not in St. Louis. I am speaking to you from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, a city in the Mississippi Delta that is home to my family. Uh, I chose to shelter in place uh, with them during the, the pandemic. And it's been so grateful and warm uh, to, to be here uh, down south. Uh, this land that I am on right now is the native land of the Chickasaw and the Quapaw uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, those are my, my people. Uh, so I, I speak to you with much gratitude in my heart uh, for, for the land and for who we are and where we are. Um, today, I wanna to speak to you on the topic of being sick and tired uh, as a designer for racial justice. Uh, this title comes from a uh, Mississippi uh, civil rights activist, Fannie Lou Hamer, who after being viciously beaten by police in 1963 in a Mississippi jail uh, for exercising her right to vote uh, went on to testify about this to the 1964 Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. And during this time, she revealed the violent and crippling discrimination and conditions of, of Black folks uh, in, in the suffering that they have uh, experienced in Mississippi. And in the midst of it, she, she expressed, all my life, I've been sick and tired. Now, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I can attest that I am someone who knows too well uh, what it's like to be sick and tired, especially as uh, an activist, as a designer. Um, outside of just being you know, a sickly child with a lot of kidney and, and bladder issues uh, when I was younger, last week marked one year since fibroids, endometriosis, and severe anemia led me to get a life-changing hysterectomy. And just last month, 
I was expectantly rushed to the ER and hospitalized for four days for what I am now still learning uh, to be a chronic syndrome within my digestive system. Since 2013, I have undergone uh, six rounds of blood transfusions, largely for anemia, uh, including the night in 2014 when the mirror casket, one of the projects that uh, my, my team, my friends, my collaborators and I have become most known for uh, during the uh, Ferguson October protests uh, was, was launched. And uh, it's, it's very weird because if you look at all of these dates, they all happen on the 10th of the month. And so we can have a whole other conversation about divine numerology and, and the meaning of that. But this is something that has been uh, a foundation and a layer of all the work that I've done for these past few years. So I, I wanna make sure that I reflect a bit on that, but expand beyond just my personal uh, experience. When I layer in the amount of exhaustion and burnout that comes with a career in activism and social work and, and design, I grapple with the definitions of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's sick and tired paradigm in a few ways, especially as they relate to our current COVID-19 pandemic, our economic crisis, racial justice protests, and our general unsettling political state of affairs. If we think about these definitions in the physical realm, yes, we might be ill and unhealthy, uh, exhausted or burned out, uh, but as they trickle down to the cultural, the social, the systemic, there might be other ways that these start to be defined across our, our, our culture and our communities. Perhaps you're annoyed and you're fed up. Uh, you feel that certain policies are, are cliche or played out, certain habits, certain norms, Things are feeling way more offensive and toxic, almost making you sick to your stomach, leaving you weary and depressed and low. Or perhaps you're recognizing that our systems at large are so unjust that it's just perverse. And the ways in which we have exploited the labor of people in our, in our nation and extracted so much from our land has tired us all in as we think about these intersections, public health, racism, the built environment plays a part. And we have to admit that in accordance with the social determinants of health that you all learned yesterday, we are living in conditions that are hell bent on keeping us sick and tired. The neglect, the inaction, and the silence of our leaders causes us to experience a special breed of collective trauma. And just in case, if you don't know the definition of that, I, I've just pasted it here. But as you know, no matter what, these illnesses, the tiredness, the trauma that we all feel so often is disproportionately stacked against Black people, for racism itself is a pandemic. And we, our elders, our ancestors, We've been fighting for generations to end this, including just last night when we lost John Lewis. But I believe that we can carry the torch that he and so many other civil rights activists have laid before us. As designers, we can carry that torch that's been lit. But there are three things that I think we have to contend with before we can, we can do that. One is recognizing that racism itself is one of the most toxic civic and social diseases that has rotted our nation's roots and pervaded throughout within and across each of its systems and structures. I think about policing because of course that's what's brought us to this current moment. Policing is one of such systems that was founded on the premise of racial power and control over black bodies and our ability to navigate across our own communities. It is telling that the most police brutality happens in public space. For police brutality is not necessarily just something that's adjacent to the built environment. It does not simply happen in the built environment. We have to contend with the fact that racial injustices like police brutality are of and by the built environment. 
by us. And as creators and designers who have such direct impact on the experiences within the built environment, we must also accept that our profession has played direct and implicit roles in creating the conditions for racial justice to never prevail where injustice is what is prevailing. So when I recognize this and expand on these definitions of sick and tired to include the built environment and design, our chart may start to look a little bit like this, where we start to place in some of these types of illnesses, types of infractions, types of injustices. Sick and tired might start to embody structural, institutional, and political conditions, policies, behaviors, and challenges that show up in the profession. But this may also allow us to see parts of our profession that could very well be indicted and dismantled for the violence that it has inflicted. And in the Slack, it's not there yet, but I will leave an empty copy of this because I would love for you to take time to reflect on how you might start to reflect on this as you perceive your vantage point as a designer. But with all of these conditions and all of these elements, I, I don't want us to just wrestle with the problems and the sickness and the tiredness. I want us to contend with how do we heal and how do we activate our energy? Let's start with healing. Now, I personally believe that healing is a process. For me, it's a spiritual process. Uh, in my sickness, I have learned that uh, I can't just take my antibiotics and refuel with probiotics and exercise and stuff. I can't just do those external things. I have to do that ongoing internal gut check to reorient my mind around what has hurt me and has caused me to not feel well. Healing, of course, is a personal process because when hatred and trauma directly impacts us, we do start to embody certain norms and habits that, I don't know, fuel uh, our sickness. And it becomes our prerogative to, to heal because not doing so can lead us towards even more chronic states of both mental and physical illness, which is what I've learned. And I'm reminded of the words of Audre Lorde, who tells us caring for ourselves is not an act of self-indulgence. We don't have to feel shame and guilt for healing, for beating and getting through and, and feeling uh, stronger than the things that have hurt us. Caring for ourselves is an act of self-preservation. And it's, a, it's, it's an act of political warfare. And so I, I wanna remind us that we don't have to heal alone because healing is a collective process too. As we're experiencing that collective trauma right now, it is critical for us to find, build, cultivate and sustain the communities that will refuel our lives with harmony and balance. As designers, this might mean ensuring that the creative communities, networks and associations that we are a part of are holding space for that collective work in dealing with the harms that have been uh, enacted across and within the spaces that we have together, that we share. Because I have to bring up another civil rights uh, activist and just remind us that when I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness as Malcolm X teaches us. But collective healing is also about shifting the historical patterns and psychologies around our culture that have harmed our communities. Here in St. Louis, I'm a former board member of Ford through Ferguson, the nonprofit organization that was created in 2015 from the Ferguson Commission report of the same name. Currently, I am a content creator for its racial healing and justice fund, which will be prioritizing a community designed and community decision-making process by which to invest in homegrown efforts that are pushing toward racial justice. This infographic that you see shows how they strive or will strive to uh, approach this. 
And I'm a, I'm a big steward that we have to invest in efforts like this that are testing something different and trying things a different way. But finally, I, I believe that healing is a creative process. I was hesitant to put that healing is, you know, a design process because emotionally it makes it, it seem like more formulaic. And with reckoning with the fact that some of the colonial and supremacist tendencies of design thinking actually harms our communities, I don't want us to assume that we can place our healing into a standardized process and just like pop out with a new innovation. There's deep work that is required for healing. And I don't want us to strip the humanity from that or send your problematic structures into it. But I do believe that we can create space, platforms, expressions, and experiences that foster healing for ourselves and amongst others. One example that I would like to share with you is uh, new from one of my, my close friends. Just this past week, Denise Shanti Brown, who's a, a designer in Baltimore, launched Black Women Flourish, which she has been designing and developing since she was a master's of design student at MICA. With this effort, this venture, she's bringing Black women together to dream and design a future where we are at the center and we're able to exert agency into the design process for our collective well being. Tomorrow, just a shameless plug, uh, you can celebrate the launch of this platform online. I'll be sure to share a link and an invitation to it to the launch party uh, on Slack. The second example that I would like to share comes from one of my friends in Philadelphia. And I'm gonna see if this video plays. All right, so there are no words with this video, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about it. And my, my final example is from my, my friends who I was just becoming friends with in Boston, and that's the team of Mass Design. Their gun violence memorial project in Chicago set a space last fall for remembrance and healing for individuals impacted by gun violence. The memorial design features uh, four houses built by, I think with 700 glass bricks and each one of these houses represent the average number of lives that were lost due to gun violence each week in America. Families who have been impacted by gun violence can contribute to uh, each one of these bricks and leave objects, memorabilia, baseball caps, notes, love letters in honor of the person who in their lives had been lost. In addition to that, Mass Design has also helped the Equal Justice Initiative uh, memorialize those who were lost to lynching down in Montgomery, Alabama. This fall, St. Louis hopefully will be able to engage with the National Memorial for Peace and Justice by hosting a commu community remembrance project ourselves as we grapple with the painful racial history that exists in our city and challenge the injustices that still exist so that we never repeat the terror and the violence of the past. I was summarizing in those words, Brian Stevenson, who's the lawyer and founder of, of EGI.
with going into a sense of restoration, I want to reflect a little bit on how design for healing, designing for healing, shifts us from a constant state of pathologization of our trauma. And it transitions us into being able to vision more possibility for our well being. And part of that requires energy, renewing our energy. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about activism. And I wanna start with another video. You know, if, if I know that in this hotel room, they have food every day, and I'm knocked on the door every day to eat, and they tell, and they open the door, let me see the, the party, let me see like them throwing salami all over the, I mean, just like throwing food around, where they're telling me there's no food in here. You know what I'm saying? Every day, I'm standing outside trying to sing my way in. You know what I'm saying? We are hungry, please let us in. We are hungry, please let us in. After about a week, that song is going to change the, we hungry, we need some food. After two, three weeks, it's like, you know, give me all the food, we're breaking out the door. And after a year, you just like, you know what I'm saying? I'm picking the lock, coming through the door, blasting, you know what I'm saying? It's like you hungry, you reached your level, you don't want any more. We asked 10 years ago. We was asking with the Panthers. We was asking with them, you know, with civil rights movement. We was asking, you know, now that those people that were asking, they're all dead and in jail. So now what do you think we're going to do? Ask. I put my gun away and grab my hand. So, you know, I relate a lot to what Pop is saying in, in that clip. Um, I used to be a big believer in, in reform. And as of late, I personally don't think that designing for reform or relying solely on, on reform is our solution. Uh, like Pac said, at some point, people get tired of asking for permission to live, tired of waiting for broken promises that we were promised years ago. Think about 40 acres and a mule. We're tired of being at the table with those who guard us against change, who are unwilling to actually shift systems. And we're tired of following the lead of those who have embodied the mandates of the oppressor. At some point, something's got to give. And I believe that a lot of our systems are ready to be made obsolete. So something within us has to compel us towards a, a new reimagining. And I believe that designing for collective healing and designing for justice will be one of the ways that we get there. So I want to share with you uh, one of the efforts that um, I'm a part of now, um, as of the last month, I joined Brian C. Lee Jr., Taylor Holloway, and Mike Ford to co-organize Designist Protest, following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and so many others that you know we know their names and we know their exact times of death by this by this point. And one of the things that, that I can say about this effort is that the design and architectural communities have shown up in droves for us, especially for our initial national cause, with over 3,000 people attempting to join in. And since then, we've had 800 designers commit to take action with us. We've organized or co-organized with 150 BIPOC designers to help lead the vision of this work. And there are six domains, areas of, of work uh, that we've been able to activate. All of this is oriented around nine current design justice demands that we've made to our profession. Now, I'm not gonna read through all of these. Uh, you could go into the website at uh, dapcollective.org.com uh, to, to get these. But just briefly, two of these demands are about ending design contracts that support the carceral state and reallocating those funds uh, to projects that actually serve towards healing uh, and reinvesting in the critical needs of our neighborhoods and communities. This also is ending crime prevention through SIPTA tactics, creating radical vision for affordable neighborhoods and housing, 
shifting public policy to support a genuinely accessible public realm that's free from embedded oppression. Ensuring community self-determination, detangling our contractual relationships with abuse of powers and labor exploitation, protecting black cultural spaces, which is one of my big things, decolonizing and instilling anti-racist design and architectural licensing, training and curriculum. There's so much that we can do uh, within just these, these nine demands, but at the heart of this, what we're expressing is a necessity for our field to challenge the priv privilege and power structures that use architecture, planning, and design as tools of oppression. And for more radical vision of racial, social, and cultural reparation through the process and outcomes of design. And these mandates require a different level of accountability across the field as the intersecting conditions of the pandemic shows us. Right now, we have the choice to either sustain the violence and the racism that exists, or really put our chops and our skills to use to design a better world. Now, I don't personally want to perpetuate the toxic nature of call out and cancel culture, but accountability requires that we have to have space and hold space for truth and reconciliation across the field. We're developing what that looks like, or at least working with others to see like, what can this entail? In addition to accountability, we have to start thinking about how do we critically unlearn and relearn and reflect across the field. On the DAP site, you'll find resources that have been compiled by designers like Brenda Zing or Bees uh, and Brian. Uh, and you can read through a library of over 700 ideas compiled by designers about how we can collectively take action. That type of critical learning is, is key to all of this. And that leads me to, to really emphasize the point that our actions just can't be forms of performative allyship and symbolic gesturing. We have to move towards political co-organization and system making, systems change making. Our systems have proven time and time again that they cannot just be improved uh, when they're intended to exclude an inherent violence. So we have, to, we have to wrestle with that. We have to detangle that. And I believe in abolition, but I don't necessarily believe that abolition is simply the absence of the state and its violence, but the presence, the infiltration of the values, practices, relationships, and role that we want. So we have a mandate to really think about what else is here, what is missing from our existing structure. And I'm reminded of my, my friend, activist Kayla Reed, who just these past few weeks co-led the success of the closing of the workhouse in St. Louis. She is someone who reminds me to keep the pressure. We have to sustain our momentum for this work. And that means building in the creative will and capacity to do it. Shifting leadership and centering those who so often have been marginalized. I believe that this is the part of our field that we resist the most because it means that folks who have hoarded power for so long have to get out the way because they actually have been, been becoming the ones blocking the change and limiting our abilities of our teams, of our field to progress towards racial justice. And then I think we have to be able to position ourselves in the work that's ahead to build collective harmonious action and model better by embodying the behaviors and practices that actually contribute to our collective well-being. This is how we transform from harm to harmony. We make the norms of our current extractive, exploitative, exclusive, capitalistic, white uh, cultures shift, fade away in some cases. And finally, I think we have to think about vision. One of my friends, Zoe Hillemeyer, told me when I was younger, like 22, 
not that much younger. You can only go as far as your body will take you. And I believe that we must equip our collective body, our nation, our communities, our profession to take us to a future that our ancestors, the John Lewis's that we've lost, those who've endured the gruesome realities of Chowtow slavery and, and Jim Crow, like Fannie Lou Hamer. We have to take them to that dream. But our daily survival and this ongoing crisis management that we have will only make it difficult to see beyond the present. So healing becomes our way of opening up our capacity for vision. And this brings me back to our chart. When we take it and we think about how sick and tired can become perhaps healing and activism is another blank one for you. I think we start to see some possibilities of what change might start to look like. I've listed just a few general categories and I would encourage you to take that blank sheet that you just saw and apply it to your context, whether it's your job, your school, neighborhood or city. What does it look like to take all the things, all those ills, all those things that make our system sick and make our policies tired and our ways of being tired? How do we reactivate that? What does that look like? I believe that the healing and activism can then create room for restoration and justice. When I think about justice and restoration, it, it is about identity, sense of belonging, restoring our sense of worth, reversing the white supremacist uh, psychological warfare that has been on black and brown mentalities about inadequacy. It means restoring our assets. Not necessarily in you know, the 40 acres and a mule, but in designing housing policy, economic stimuli, educational advances, decarceration, in order to restore wealth, land, and livelihoods back to BIPOC folks who have been exploited. It means restoring our well being, our healthcare system, our collective care system. And it means restoring our energy. In the midst of all, I, I think we, we can do this. Um, but it, it, it takes a long term commitment. And I hope that our commitment is for healing. I believe that our, our healing is, is essential. I think the greatest casualty of trauma is not only the depression and the emotional scars, but also the loss of the ability to dream and imagine another way of healing. So as designers, our healing is political, is protest. I wanna end on this note, just tying back in Fannie, uh, a reflection on Fannie Lou Hamer. You know, I, I think her endurance of brutality, otherization, still speaks volumes. She was grounded in who she was and whose she was. She was a, a person of the people, not the capitalism, not the systems, not the oppression, but the people. And I believe that we have to embody this steadfast energy and conviction for the fight that is ahead. So I welcome you to like challenge me, join me in conversation uh, as we go into our, our Q and A. Um, but I, I want to end once again with a thank you and with an honor and an expression of gratitude to Congressman John Lewis. I hope that with this and the good trouble that we can do together, that we can all find our path uh, towards healing and towards justice. Thank you. <laughs>